So welcome, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll invite the speakers up on stage here. Um, if you wanna join us and we'll uh, get this party started. Did it just get awkward in here? I don't know. It's not awkward for me, it doesn't bother me. If it's awkward for you, that's your own prerogative. Welcome Angela, Barat, Brent, how's it going? Awesome. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, super excited to have you all. Real quick, just another the rules of the road for this last amazing session. Last but definitely not least, I will tell you, Angela brought Brent. Someone before you joined said that this is a session they've been waiting for the whole two days. So that's exciting. Um, we were we are gonna do, I know everybody's asked a lot of comments, chats, things in the in the in the comment and chat there. Uh, we are going to do this one a little bit more presentation style. They'll kind of give their talks, and then we'll do some Q&A at the back end, um, give you opportunity to ask your questions and things like that. So without further ado, I'm gonna, these fine people are going to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning with Angela Sheffield from Raft, Brent Horan from Hypergiant, and Barash Sharma from, from Raft again. So the stage is yours. Thank you, Matt. So again, we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Before we get started, we'll just say hi. I'm Angie Sheffield, Senior Director from Artif of Artificial Intelligence at Raft. Hi, I'm Bryn Horine from Hypergiant. I'm the Director of Advanced Programs uh, and also, as I'll touch on later, Principal Investigator of an uh, Army project on robotic combat vehicle sustainment. Hi, my name is Bharat, but before we begin, I want to just say thanks, being the last chat, last session of the day. Uh, thanks to DU and the organizers back, backstage for organizing this. It's been great, uh, but my name is Bharat. I'm the CTO for Raft. Awesome, and with that, we'll get started. We'll be talking, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll just kind of talk about what we're talking about as we get into it, if you can go to the next slide, Brent. But again, we'll be talking about not just artificial intelligence and machine learning, though we will give um, you know just a little bit of background on the subject, enough to, to be on a level playing field about getting into this, but really focusing on operationalizing artificial intelligence and machine learning powered capabilities for DOD and in the context of what we've been talking about for the past two days, you know, in the context of DevSecOps and open architectures and certainly reflective of everything we know as a community, you know, kind of this many years into digital modernization and advanced modern approaches to digital and software and data. So again, okay, so just to begin to give a little bit of background about oftentimes, uh, you know, people say, what is what is artificial intelligence? What does it mean to you? What is it technically? And so we wanted just to start with presenting our perspective, presenting a def set of definitions for artificial intelligence in this forum. And the way that I like to talk about artificial intelligence is these kind of two levels of AI. First is little AI, like the technical definition of artificial intelligence and what it entails and big AI. And little AI, this is the technology system, this is the small component, this is the specific capability that is, you know, than what we think of AI to be, designed to perceive, reason, act, infer, decide, adapt, to achieve a best outcome. And some aspects, I mean, an, an, a little AI system can do any number of these things, or a couple of them, or many of them um, can perceive, can make an inference, can uh, recommend a decision, can adapt to, uh, you know, so it can do one or many of these things. But a part, one aspect of artificial intelligence that differentiates it from just modeling and simulation or computational science is this aim of achieving some best outcome. So there would be the ability to generate and then select between outcomes. And there's some smarts in there about what might be best. So that's how I like to talk about um, little AI, you know, but again, this bundle of a specific set of data, a particular algorithm, and compute. Those three things together make little AI the technical definition for artificial intelligence. And I'll just pause. Uh, in just a sec, we can get into some of the algorithms aspect in that graphic on the slide. But there's this other part of AI that is often like the big AI in the room, which is the expectation that 
lots of people have, especially senior decision makers, especially non-technical people, the expectation that artificial intelligence is this technology system that will augment, that will enhance um, our ability as humans to discover, reason, and make decisions. This kind of bigger category of AI as a technology that will help us achieve our missions better and kind of, if you're not outside of DOD or national security, you know, enhance our lives. And oftentimes decision makers, oftentimes people are talking about big AI in this context, this kind of philosophical concept of humans partnering with a technology system to achieve some awesomeness. But technically artificial intelligence is this specific bundle of data algorithms, which is math and code and compute. And in terms of data, man, I'm going to, oh, man, anything I'm about to say could be like a whole session in itself. So I'll move quickly. But um, one of the really special things that has been part of the, the right now AI revolution is the growth in data, particularly in unstructured data and data that we've never traditionally thought of as data, images, text, those weren't data. Um, kind of before this current revolution of artificial intelligence. And that's been a huge contributor to the growth in this as an area of research and an important area of application for the DoD. Secondly, in the algorithm space, we sometimes inextricably, inextricably think of AI and machine learning. You know, you hear AI ML, machine learning, deep learning. Machine and deep learning are a class of algorithmic approaches to achieve this goal of artificial intelligence but they're certainly not it. Um, again, that could be like a whole other talk. And I think we'll talk you know, uh, quite a bit about deep learning in this session, but just to say they are a class of algorithms that are in artificial intelligence, but not the only way. Certainly there are lots, again, that could be a whole talk, but not the only way. Um, and then finally, when it comes to compute, again, the growth, this revolution in artificial intelligence has come because of this growth in AI, because of the some progress in the new algorithms, particularly machine and deep learning, but also because of the growth in non-traditional approaches to compute, cloud compute, and heterogeneous computing ecosystems. Those things together is why we've also seen such a growth in artificial intelligence, because those are the three components to make it possible. And there's been a little bit of this converging revolution in all of them at the same time. Now, tra now, traditionally, if we can say traditionally when it comes to AI, it being such a new field, even in this revolution, but traditionally, you would achieve this data algorithms and compute bundle with everything right on top of itself. And all the data right there and all, I mean, cloud computing is not on top of itself, but everything is together. And one thing we have realized as we think, as we thought about operationalizing artificial intelligence and really bringing it into the DoD and the way that we achieve missions is that in the DOD, not everything is on top of it, right there on top of each other in that way. You know, our data is all over the place. Um, we're now more aware of operational paradigms or, or concepts of operations where we don't have ready access to the sort of super powerful compute that it has traditionally taken to train or run AI algorithms. And this has emerged as a really important area of artificial intelligence for DOD. So now that we know, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, we were just curious, you see these image classification algorithms and cat videos and stuff, you know, does that work for the DOD? Yeah, many of us, I know Brent Barat, we were part of some of the early efforts to see, okay, you can take these algorithms that find cats and we can find aircraft to generate an order of battle. Okay, cool. But now that now that we're past that point, now that we're thinking about operationalizing AI, it becomes a totally different um, concept of instead of this data algorithms compute all together in an easy way, what does it look like in the context of an operational environment? And that's um, it, it kind of excitingly when Brent Barat and I came together, first Barat and I at Raft and then to present to prepare for this talk, you know, this turns out this is the work that we're doing at Raft and the work at Hypergiant because we take AI into the field to solve mission problems. And it's turning them out to be this kind of more advanced capability than the AI all on top of itself. So that's a little bit of background and a, a jump ahead to where we are in DOD AI. With that, I'll turn it over to Barat to contextualize this in 
DevSecOps and the conversations we've been having the last two days. Thanks, Angie. That's great. So uh, thanks for setting the stage. You know, we understand now, you know, where AI fits in, but also most of what we'll be talking about in this talk will be, you know, what does AI uh, look like, uh, AI and ML look like at the edge, right? But before we talk about that, I want to take a, a zoom out approach and talk about what does edge first even mean, right? So a lot of people define edge in different ways. Everybody has a subjective definition of edge. My personal binary definition is if you're in a brick or mortar building, you're most likely not at the edge, right? So, uh, uh, so now that we sort of know what edge first means, it could be a ship, it could be a tack unit. Uh, from a tactical perspective, it means that we're working in some known and some unknown constraints, right? So we can't think of the edge as just another cloud. We just simply don't have the resources. So if we're working in constraints, and those constraints could be small pipes, intermittent networks, adversarial signal jamming, which we saw in the news recently, or various other things, right? When those things happen in the middle of ingesting, ingesting the data, uh, processing the data, replicating the data, you need a way to have a checkpoint mechanism, right? So uh, you know your things are going to crash at the edge for various reasons, uh, uh, like adversarial jamming and other things. But when they do, you want to make sure they come back up and start from the same point where they left off. And how do you do that? You do that through having checkpoint mechanisms, which we'll talk more about in uh, next few slides. Also, if you're at the edge, uh, there is a mobile uh, unit, like a back of a Humvee or you're, you're inside a TAC unit. You need to be able to collect data at extremely fast speeds. And that data then needs to be made available back to the enterprise when you have comms again, right? So be having the ability to understand when you don't have comms, retaining that data locally, and we, when you establish comms again, sending that data back to the enterprise. And what happens when you don't have the cloud, but you still wanna be able to share data between two different edges, right? You wanna be able to replicate the data between two different edges but you don't have the uh, same things that you would in a different cloud regions. And maybe that's because you're forming a mesh network. Uh, it could be multiple TAC units talking to each other, but could be multiple satellites even talking to each other. And also when you're at the edge in a contested environment, especially going back to what Angie mentioned, you know, operationalizing these things means you're actually fielding these things in contested environments you need to be able to move at the speed of relevance. What that means is you need to be able to push updates to the software stack, as well as update your AI models in real time. Because uh, the data that you trained your AI ML algorithm with will more than likely change in a contested field. And that change could be because of weather conditions, adversaries, or anything else. Uh, but as a software stack, as an ML stack, you need to be able to push real-time updates uh, both to the software stack as well as the ML algorithm. And the last thing I'll say, going back to NG and operationalizing these things, um, your ML algorithms that live in Jupyter notebooks don't mean anything at the edge, right? Because they're not operationalized. So if your if your ML algorithms all uh, life live in Jupyter notebooks, they're worth basically nothing. They're worth zero unless you're fielding them and you're inferring them and actually uh, operationalizing them. Uh, next slide, Brent. Great. So now that we know what a definition of an edge first looks like, let's let's see if we what we have today, tools uh, among uh, all of us within the enterprise, have enough to be able to do these things uh, on data side at the edge first. Sadly, it doesn't look like we have all the fields. Like as an industry, we're we're spending about eighty percent of our efforts building platforms infrastructure and apps and way less effort on actual data. When all of those, th those three things, platform, infrastructure, and apps, all they're being built for is to actually collect and produce and um, uh, extract insights from the data. So data truly is the new plutonium as Brigadier General Olson recently said. So, uh, but all is not uh, dark, right? There's offices like ABMS, CDAO, CAO, and Jake, we're pushing the needle here and they're building the data stacks. Uh, so I, I feel like data's platform one moment is just around the corner, right? So uh, what do we need for an edge first data platform now that we know what, what edge means? 
our traditional CI/CD pipelines that we're all used to that push and scan software, uh, scan uh, containers, and then push those containers to dev staging prod, those are not enough to be able to uh, build operationalized edge-first data platforms. What you truly need is you need a configurable way to be able to do ETL on data. ETL really means extract, transform, and load. So when you're collecting raw data, you need, you need to be able to enrich that data. You need to be able to load that data into different systems. It could be one or n amount of systems. And those are the pipelines that we're interested in on the data side, not just traditional CICD pipelines. And those pipelines need to be configurable in real time at the uh, time that we need. We need a platform that is robust and resilient. What that means is it can't take platform 60 minutes or two days to come back up. It needs to be immutable, which I think uh, around the two days, uh, a lot of people have covered. Uh, so that part is already taken care of. We need data centricity as well, right? So data centricity means that all of us need to be able to find data that are that is in different data silos from a single and central place. And I'll cover in the next slides why that is important from AI and ML perspective. We need a confident way to be able to automatically provision different tools within the data sphere. And those tools are not uh, your traditional SBOMs or, or Kubernetes stacks, but those tools look like MQTT, which is a way, which is a protocol to be able to collect fast data at the edge in an IoT device. You need things like Kafka, which take that fast data and then uh, send it in real time to the enterprise. You need things like Flink, going back to the checkpoint mechanism uh, I mentioned, being able to stop and go uh, uh, have things crash and make things come back up in real time. You need not Jupyter notebooks, but you need a way to serve the models, uh, right? So I'll talk about what some of those things mean in the next slides, but those are things that we need on the data side. Uh, and we need a way also to be able to prioritize data. So if you're at the edge and going back to those constraints, you have smaller pipes, you can't just send all of your data back to the enterprise, right? Because you have your low bandwidth. You need to be able to prioritize which data is most important to you at that uh, point in time and have only that set of data go back to the enterprise or have that data uh, be replicated with another edge device. Uh, so all of these things, uh, you know, are things that uh, Raft and Hypergiant are working on. We're collaborating with CAO, SOCOM, and uh, other folks to be able to make some of these things happen. So uh, we're we're all trying to move the needle there. Next slide, uh, Brent. Great. Uh, so from AI and ML perspective, right? So doing these things in order to be able to innovate at the edge. Uh, and have a culture shift of thinking about data as a first-class citizen of everything we do, takes more zero to one innovation, which requires being able to build, learn, and iterate fast. We can't take uh, months and years to be able to uh, develop new features as they pertain to data. So in order to be able to do that, we need to make sure we're doing some common tasks and laying the foundation well to be able to extract those insights using AI and ML. So I'll talk about some what those some of those common tasks are. So we need to take the pain of data wrangling away from folks who uh, uh, who are operationalizing and building the algorithms. The math part, going back to what Angie mentioned, right? So the data wrangling means collecting the data, enriching the data, labeling the data, uh, putting all the data in the same place. So when you're building the algorithms, the uh, team uh, focus on that math part doesn't need to go to multiple different places. So that's what a, what data wrangling piece looks like. And that's that's what the pipelines uh, enable you to do to be able to collect all the data in a central place. And more data is always better for algorithms. I know there's research being done and, and we're at the cutting edge where less data can be can be um, uh, can get the same results, but any ML engineer will tell you more data is always better. Right? So how do they get that more data? you need to be able to make your data silos discoverable. And data silos could be those CSV files that you've saved in your downloads folder uh, because you have to present your report. Uh, it could also be a some Postgres database setting that is non-discoverable within the enterprise. So those are data silos and you need a way to be able to centralize those data silos without copying them over, right? You don't want to create multiple uh, sources of truth. And, and uh, also the culture of 
the culture which we see quite a bit in the DoD, the culture of my data needs to change to our data, right? So what that means is people need to open up access into their data and that access needs to be governed from a central place. So there's tons of work being done on the central centralization of ICAM within the Air Force and DoD. I won't go too much into that, but why that's needed is uh, you know, your AI ML team, if they need to go to 10 different places to collect the data, and each one of those places is going to make them fill out a PDF form that needs to be emailed uh, and attached and signed in Adobe, they're going to lose steam quite fast. They're not going to be able to focus on the ML part. Um, and also, so a lot of people say we do AI ML. Uh, I feel like AI ML is not just done. You, it's done to achieve something. Right, defining that something is the crux of being able to do AI ML. So what that what, what that really means is being able to contextualize the problem, uh, contextualize the data, and then focusing on the math part. If you uh, if you talk to any 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 person who builds ML engineers on the math part, they won't know the contextualization of the problem. The folks who are operationalized uh, on on the C two side, they know the problem well. And in the past, we've seen AppWorks do this super well. So recently, AppWorks did what's called a datathon in collaboration with the MIT AI Accelerator. They provided the industry physiological data from test pilots and asked, hey, looking at these physio physiological uh, data sets, you know, X and Y movements, uh, movements of head, uh, heart rate, and other things, can you predict the difficulty level of a test flight? And the industry went and did it. Uh, they, uh, uh, that's when we could focus on the actual uh, algorithmic problem and not really focus on, hey, how do we get to the data set and how do we get to the IML? It's a clear definition of what the problem looks like. So that was a cool uh, thing that AppWorks did. I think they're doing a second version of their datathon right now, which is in process um, today. Um, so also our data stacks need to need feature source. So what are feature source? Just like all of us are familiar with uh, databases, uh, feature source are databases for ML systems, right? What they enable uh, ML systems to do is centralize all the parameters. And parameters, you can imagine parameters should be as simple as uh, changing the X and Y coordinates on, on a system. But those X and Y coordinates are really fine tuning your ML algorithm, whether you, whether you detect something as cat or something as dog, right? But being able to change those parameters in real time for hundreds of algorithms at the same time, that's what feature stores enables you to do. Um, and then being able to share insights, training results, tuning hyperparameters is also uh, what data teams need. And that happens through notebooks, right? Not dashboards. Dashboards are for uh, the commanders who want to make insights from the data, but notebooks, Jupyter notebooks that we can share are truly for folks who are making the pipelines, data pipelines that enable those dashboards. And finally, I think uh, this applies not just to AIML, but DevSecOps in general. I think as an industry, we just need to move away from buzzwords more, but rather focus on the operational value, as well as be curious to learn the deep knowledge behind the buzzwords, as opposed to uh, using just the buzzwords. And with that, I'll pa pass it over to Brent to talk more about the use cases and scenarios of data uh, 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 data at the edge. Got to unmute myself there. So now I'd like to uh, uh, take from what uh, Angie and Barada said and take us really to that far edge. Now we're talking embedded systems. But first, a uh, little bit more context. You know, we know that uh, you know, armed forces are being asked to do more with fewer warfighters trying to deal with that recruitment uh, retention problems. Uh, our adversaries have had a couple of decades to watch us uh, fight and, and uh, prepare for that. Where this is going is that now we have this concept of software-defined warfare. And uh, part of that, a big part of that, is putting sensors everywhere. But as we've heard, uh, that's doesn't solve anything by itself. That just floods us with tons of data. How do we deal with that data? 
you know, with the ultimate goal of providing that commander with course of action recommendations uh, at sufficient speed and novelty to achieve that operational surprise, all right? So, um, but that data, um, uh, you know, massive amounts of data coming at us is a huge challenge. Uh, why do we want to do AI at the far edge? Uh, Barat touched on that. Uh, you know, think about that satellite in LEO uh, orbit, and uh, you might get a 10-minute ground station window uh, pass every 90 minutes or something like that. We need to uh, move much faster than that. Uh, make that decision or insight on orbit perhaps send that information on link 16 right down to a shooter and be able to move that pace of battle much faster. That requires putting that AI at that far edge, uh, maximizing data protection, not having to have lots of data in flight with the security risk associated with that. Um, but ultimately coping with that deny constrained discontiguous network backhaul. Um, you know, that really motivates us to put the inferences engines at that far edge. Um, you know, that creates some challenges. Uh, we've got very low swap uh, C2 considerations to deal with, uh, some security issues. But also, AI solutions, as we were touching on earlier, they're not static. Uh, we're always getting new data to improve our models. The technology is evolving. Uh, the context, uh, the uh, the situation is changing. And so we really need to bring that agility to AI solutions. But we still have a challenging network to be able to push those uh, updates back out to that far edge. So everything we do has to have that um, uh, network challenge in mind. So we're used to modern software processes with uh, small frequent updates, uh, but yeah, getting those to the edge in a secure matter, uh, manner is, is a challenge. Uh, as mentioned several times here, I don't have to go into a whole lot of details, but, you know, hopefully you've captured uh, some of the the value of Platform One, Big Bang, Iron Bank, uh, Party Bus, all these uh, systems uh, that really help in this matter. Uh, Zarf uh, from uh, Defense Unicorns has been mentioned a few times. I'll uh, uh, touch on that briefly. There's some adaptations we need to uh, uh, tackle, uh, particularly get these uh, um, you know, common software systems that that we're used to working in, uh, uh, you know, x80, x64 type of uh, um, platforms. Now we need to get those running on ARM. That's not a huge challenge, but we still need to get those back in the Iron Bank and and be able to adapt those on some of these downsized processors we find at the edge. Let me pivot a little bit and make this real. Um, uh, one of the projects I work on is this Army Robotic Combat Vehicles. These are designed to operate one to two kilometers ahead of the forward line of troops. They're unmanned. They're robotic. There's no one in there to feel a, a, a new funny vibration or to hear a bearing squealing or a belt squealing or to smell some antifreeze or or smell some oil dropping on something hot. So, so we need to uh, basically put a bunch of sensors in there, in that vehicle to replace the human senses. Um, but again, we're right away confronted with that challenging communication environment. And whatever bandwidth we do get out of that network really needs to be um, mostly devoted to driving and operating the systems. It's a robotic system, by the way, after all, right? So uh, that's going to take priority over any of these uh, sensor data and that type of thing. So we have to do that uh, data reduction at the source, and we need to be able to push those updates out, even if that's one to two kilometers uh, ahead of us. 
So now we're talking about running these complex workloads at that far edge. How are we going to do that? We don't have skilled DevSecOps engineers out there. We've got Kubernetes. We're, we're getting more and more comfortable with the adoption of Kubernetes, um, but we need to make sure that we're using versions, let's say like K3s, that is adapted for uh, ARM processors and uh, deals with some of the, the, the weight issue on running on an embedded system. Um, you know, part of that is orchestration tools generally assume uh, very wide bandwidth, low latency network connections that are always on, unlimited compute capacity. That doesn't exist at the edge, um, at the far edge. And uh, but we still need to uh, anticipate unscheduled outages and be able to self-recover from that. Doesn't do any good to deploy those robots out there if you still have to send a soldier uh, a kilometer ahead and press a reset button. So now we need to get updates out to the edge, right? So we're we're able to get, uh, you know, run these AI algorithms out there, get insights, maybe squeeze that insight uh, over that narrow bandwidth, but we still need to get those updates out to the edge. Uh, it's not always going to be when they're deployed out on the line, but uh, it's they're still going to be in theater. And so we're still going to have uh, some challenges. In particular, there's um, real security challenges. Uh, you, you don't, you know, we... Maybe we want killer robots, but we don't necessarily want robotic, uh, rogue uh, killer robots type of thing, right? So we want to make sure that they stay under our control. So uh, that's likely going to imply an air-gapped installation or certainly a secured installation. Uh, uh, we're going to probably want uh, a version of uh, the service mesh that you heard about in the last uh, session, being able to make sure that we have a uh, secure environment. Uh, we're not going to have just one model on the robot. There's going to be one monitoring the tracks and suspension system, the one monitoring the, the diesel engine. It's an electric hybrid, by the way. So you've got uh, the energy and batteries to monitor along with the payload. So we're gonna have lots of different uh, mini applications or microservices running on this. So uh, now you've got these things deployed out there. Um, uh, in, in traditional world, you do this once a year at a depot uh, stateside, right, uh, before you deploy, and you can make sure that all your vehicles are updated. In this agile world, uh, out there in the field, uh, while you're engaged in uh, perhaps a conflict, uh, we need to update that. Now we've got to make sure we're tracking what versions are on which uh, system. So to wrap it up here, uh, there's a lot going on. There's layers to this, and uh, there might be some uh, activities uh, that are uh, tightly connected with Platform One, let's say, and uh, uh, but then there's uh, that aspect that's happening on the edge also. We're going to uh, rely on Kubernetes. We're going to rely on Zarf to help us deploy these type of things out there. Um, uh, there's no one solution. It uh, really depends on the, the scenario, the platform you're dealing with, and a problem you're trying to solve. So uh, there's no uh, you know silver bullet to solve all these things. But there's a lot of tools in our tool chest that we can rely on. So I'll hand it back to uh, Barat at this point. Oh, it's me. Surprise. Oh, Angie, I'm sorry. <laughs> back no, always. Oh, man. I hope that the audience was like in the trance that I know Barat and I were like, oh, my gosh. But also appreciating, I mean, if anyone, so few of us have done this in this way that, that Barat just talked through. And it is, it, it's also new. But, you know, if you've done any machine learning or that, you know, it's kind of like you probably pointed, you're on your computer. Like Brad said, you're in a notebook, you point to your data and it's there, you know, like, and we're, that's not what this looks like. And I, and I think we really hope that, that everyone participating is, 
is under is beginning to understand that it is it's so much more complex and interesting and powerful than that, um, but so much more. And so Brent talked about a lot of the compute the compute aspects of being in the field. And again, you know, you're sharing compute with other capabilities. You're, you know, getting the algorithms um, to the field. And the aspect that I'll just spend a, a minute to talk about is the data, you know, how we're beginning to appreciate that when it comes to operationalizing AI and realizing concepts like joint all domain command and control or imagining what does it look like to be an AI powered or data enabled organization that is more than just, you know, a person sitting at their computer screen, you know, it's a whole, um, you know, at, at, at Ashland, you, you know, whole, a whole organization or perhaps a whole command, you know, what does that look like? And beginning to really understand that just kind of as Brent walked through some of those specifics about those other components of AI, compute, algorithms, a little, you know, uh, sh sharing resources at the edge. This is going to be about getting precisely the data that you need for, you know, what Brent needs or for an application in an air operations center or, to enable, you know, to getting the information the decision maker needs or a mission application, getting the data that that capability needs, whether it's a human or a machine, at the right place and the right time, despite contested environments, despite limited bandwidth. Um, it's so much, you know, we can't just assume that the data is going to be there. And that is a, that's a challenge. It's, you know, logistics is what, what, what do they say, you know? Uh, they say, you know, something will sort of what the logistics will, will end it. I mean, it's this it's the same sort of concept for data. When Barat said that data is plutonium or we hear that data is the new oil, kind of, except that it's really this logistics of getting the data where you need it to be to enable the missions. And so some of the work that we're doing at Raft, imagining enabling data operations from the enterprise where it's still very hard, but easy in terms of the resources available to you, that data algorithms compute, that's easy. AI at the end, not easy, but easier. Um, all the way out to the edge, to whatever that Barat mentioned, you know, edge can mean, everybody's kind of an edge, you know, unless you're in that brick and mortar building, but also that very far edge. And what does it take to develop, uh, to, to build a data pipeline, this precision data capability, a data pipeline capability that gets the data to the right places, kind of regardless of, or not regardless of, but um, configurable to whatever your resources are available to you, but also resilient to that DDIL environment, resilient to, uh, you know, perhaps the data feed is interrupted. How do how does my AI make a decision next, even though I'm not getting the data feed because the network is interrupted? That is really the challenge. And we hope also that you appreciate from this that, you know, um, Bharat also mentioned perhaps this is this is data's platform. One moment, perhaps, certainly data has been in the spotlight with the DOD AI strategy, or excuse me, the DOD data strategy and data and AI strategies. Um, and all of the effort around standardizing data. and But certainly you're beginning to appreciate that any sort of expectation that we could, that, that we would very clearly know what our data is and would have time to standardize it and could have these you know, very uh, bespoke connections between data, that you, none of that will work. It's hard to implement now in a time of relative peace, strategic competition, but, but peace, for us, acknowledging what's happening in Europe. Um, but that doesn't work in the fog of war. You know, we need to design systems that are resilient to or designed uh, to be flexible enough to handle data that you've never seen before and get it to the right place at the right time and it be part of, you know, informing something like in the system that Brent is developing. So much more complex, much more interesting um, than, than we had generally appreciated again when we started making cat videos. but finding aircraft. Um, next slide, please. So emerging uh, emerging ways of thinking about this in the literature and in industry is the new concept of decentralized or distributed data systems, distributed artificial intelligence. And this is for those familiar with, and now everyone's familiar with DevSecOps, this is a really similar concept, open architecture, continuous into development and integration. You know, this, a very similar sort of concept to that, but just but this distributed architecture, or sometimes called a data fabric architecture, and so just to highlight some of 
um, what goes into creating these, what we at Raft are building, um, that goes into to realizing kind of all of that context that, that I just spoke to in terms of data, um, leveraging advances in software, advances in, because you can't, this is going to, there's AI, like, uh, you know, there were some messages in the chat, there's AI about sensing and making a decision to make this sort of precision data logistics happen takes intelligence in the processing at the field and knowing where to disseminate the data. So there's, you know, tons of AI, little AI in this sort of data, data fabric ecosystem. But, um, you know, the, I just want to put that up there to show us the, the suite of micro, the suite of data services that would go into an architecture like this to make it possible. Um, these we have developed for broad mention, uh, customers with the Department of the Air Force, Chief Data, an AI office with SOCOM, with the Space Force, um, contributing to changing our expectation about what data and AI, AI will look like, really operationalized in the DOD and contributing, uh, you know, as, as they are at Hypergiant by developing solutions and sharing them with the community. Oh, oh and then also plug because of where we are, um, leveraging uh, all of the investments, leadership and technology wise, in DOD, in a platform one, in the community um, of, of open sourcing and sharing and hardening an iron bank, building on top of that capability to facilitate um, sharing of these, of, of these software tools across the community and also hoping for easier ATO. Oh, I know I'm saying that to a community of folks who probably know what that feels like so easier ATO, but certainly standing on the shoulders of giants and contributing right back in this area. Um, so next slide, please, Brent. We were successful in making sure that there was enough time for a little bit of discussion. We have some thoughts just to kind of kick off a Q&A session that will get us going, but I know folks have been putting things up in the chat, but if you have some other questions, please feel free to start throwing them up there now. Um, I'm gonna mention just, this middle bullet here speaks to a little bit of what I was talking about on that OV1, AV1 chart. Again, always remembering that particularly for the, especially for the DOD, we need to be designing data systems, AI systems that are designed to survive first contact with an uncharacterized operating environment. That's, you know, the way that you normally build AI that it doesn't work like that. That means you're, we're solving that wrong problem. The problem is AI data that work with an un, first contact with an unknown thing. It's a whole paradigm shift, but it's the real problem. Um, and with that, I will ask to Brent and Barat. Um, I know that we talked when we were prepping for this, and I'm sure there have been many conversations throughout these two days about, you know, we say we know that open architectures and microservice based architectures are part of the solution. Um, both as a best practice, but also because these problems are so complex and will take all of the best of us to solve them. Um, so can you, maybe starting with you, Brent, talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in designing, but then also, you know, we are an industry, uh, our stuff has to get bought. So in procuring microservice-based architectures. Yeah, let me, let me uh, instead try to address Kit's question here because I think it's it kind of touches on this a little bit and uh, uh, he's asking can you guys discuss what a continuous ATO would look like for the life cycle of a model perhaps running at the edge and um, I'm not sure I can actually uh, but I know some of the the challenges that we need to to do that and it does touch on this um, you know uh, designing and procuring these uh, uh, open microservice-based architectures, uh, the you know the the challenge in um, that continuous ATO is is being able to harden every step of the process, and uh, like Zarf does a great job of uh, getting us across that air gap in a, a secure way and. And one that's consistent and and uh, auditable. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the the best word for it, but um, you know, a a hardware designer is going to choose the right uh, platform, compute platform for their 
uh, hardware. And um, that's probably going to be different for an RCV or, uh, you know, uh, 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 some other a radar system or, or something like that, right? So uh, there's going to need to be some effort at um, authorizing that chain. But fortunately, once that's done, it's pretty static. And so uh, we do have lots of copies out there, but they should be pretty identical. So I, I don't know that that fully answers it, but I think it uh, is, uh, you know, may, maybe talks about some of the, the pros and cons associated with that. But I do think that we need to lean heavily on what we've learned in uh, in platform one and, and edge one and, and that type of uh, type of thing. Yeah, uh, to add to that and maybe a bit more cynical, but like I, I, I think absolutely we should use things that are already uh, there, ZARF, platform one, SBOMS, six store, cosine, like this is not a problem that is unique to DOD. Where it becomes unique to DOD is that human in the loop Right, so uh, like my, it's a grim statement, but your ATO or your CATO is as good as the people approving it. Uh, if they don't understand stuff, they're not, then your all your end-to-end -end system is gonna fall apart. So uh, that education and culture change definitely needs to happen. And I think that's part of what we're doing here as well, right? Uh, so that that both things have to be hand in hand. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of challenges with the um, you know the idea of a, a model. It, it, we're we're just getting to the point of being able to explain models and why they're coming up with the decisions they are uh, providing, and uh, even in a cloud type of environment and uh, in a static environment. But uh, there's a lot that we need to have a chain of custody associated with our data. And with the process for retraining that, uh, I think a lot of these, once, once you get it in initial deployment, you're, you're fine tuning that model. And maybe that uh, means you're only operating on the last couple of layers and a very deep neural network and only shipping those out. Um, but there's still uh, a big, big challenge that I think uh, as we, <laughs> as we uh, you know, overcome those challenges in these cloud-based systems and, and software-centric systems that uh, we'll, we'll have to take up that challenge in uh, AI and, and at the edge also. If we have time, I wanted to address Aji's question in the Q&A because it also speaks to a little bit about something Brent just, uh, j just said. Um, but Audrey asks um, about the current state of AI for behavioral analysis for physical security and online security. So can we, you know, whatever, nominally find an insider threat based on their activity in the computer? And I wanted, I was typing back an answer that was technical about the way machine learning and deep learning work, which is that it's hard to find training data. So it'd be hard to train the models. Um, it's also, that's not just a technical barrier, you know, it's to, um, to Brent's point about explainable AI, you know, it just would even be hard to kind of show it to get it verified to be a real tool. But I wanted to step back and share just for people who are approaching, trying to figure out is AI a solution for your problem, just kind of a step back of that, which is for a problem like what Audrey presented, we still have to kind of think of that system and think of the information and think of the system behavior to understand if the AI is likely to work. So in the case of behavior analysis for, for physical systems based on online security, whatever, um, we have to first ask, do we expect that there is a there is predictable and detectable behavior in that way that we're observing what we're looking for, trying to, you know, is it reasonable to expect that we can try to detect that um, and that it would be reliable, a reliable indicator of a bad guy's activity? And often there's an opportunity to draw back on um, previous sciences and literature, like what does behavioral science say about that? To find even to see if there would be a feature that we could detect in that particular data before we think about even applying AI or machine learning or deep learning to be able to uh, uh, to detect it. Um, so I thought it was a really helpful. It was it was a nice example of thinking about how we approach a problem and seeing if there's an AI solution in it, 
And with that, I'll, I'll ask Brent Barat, do you have any additional comments about um, sort of a, that particular problem or shaping a, shaping an AI solution in a mission partners problem? I think I think I would say contextualizing the prob the problem and then uh, visualizing it. A lot of people uh, are we're all visual learners, right? So just talking about the problem versus uh, drawing a parallel. If if we can't build anything in in a super fast way, drawing a parallel for for things that they might use in every day to day lives, right? So when you leave the base, you do call it Uber, right? From your phone, your phone is the edge device. Right. And in real time, it's detecting which is the best car you should get. What is the rate? That is AI ML at the edge. Right. Sure, it doesn't have intermittent connectivity. Maybe you lose, uh, maybe you can uh, turn off your signal or something and see how that behaves. But that is what AI ML sort of at the edge would look like. Excellent. And uh, what about this last question from from Biff? Did you guys answer that already? Any good resources on building ML ops teams for any program? I think. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Brent. Well, it's it's definitely a challenge just to uh, to hire, much less uh, uh, you know uh, build a team and uh, uh, and and whatnot. So. Um, yeah, no, no easy answers there, but there are more and more tools out there that uh, are are heading towards low code and no code type solutions. So I think we're going to be able to uh, address some of those, uh, you know, more challenging team building uh, uh, type of things. I mean, uh, yeah, in general, you're going to need data scientists, you're going to need uh, ML engineers and DevSecOps. Uh, we're uh, uh, at Hypergiant, we're a design forward firm. And so we have designers on our projects also, because we believe that the uh, process is not done until the inside is actually internalized in uh, the user's mind and uh, to where they can make a decision. And so we need to be uh, uh, you know, sensitive about that cognitive uh, process. And so I think all those people need to be on your overall team. I know that's a little broader than ML Ops itself, but, uh, but yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of work uh, that we're doing and, and many, many others are doing about uh, trying to provide more support for that uh, data scientist and uh, machine learning engineer in terms of all of the uh, ML ops processes and all. Fantastic. Love it. Well, thank you. Really great, great session from Brent, Marat, and Angela. Wonderful. I'm clapping. I hope everyone else is behind the screens that we can't see them. Um, I know I learned a lot, so really grateful there. Um, so yeah, Angela, Barat, Brent, thanks again. Thanks for having us. It's Thank been uh, it's been a lot of fun and a great uh, a great program over the two days. Absolutely. Great. Thank it you for everybody behind this uh, stage as well. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Gerald's looking for the hoodie. Yeah. So uh, we're going to end with a few words from our uh, wonderful host, Mr. Slaughter. Um, and I, and I learned, I did not know he was Dr. Slaughter. So that's a fun thing to make fun of him later for. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, I kind of threw a couple of links before I let Rob say his piece Threw a couple of links in there, um, to make sure, please fill out the feedback survey for these sessions. It also gives you a chance to say, Hey, I want to be contacted by, and you can select who and which uh, session you want to be reached out to get more information, learn more from. Again, you can, you can get the videos and the, and, the slides and the P and the PDFs and such are in the lobby. We'll also be sending them all out. We're not done. I'm just making sure I give you this. We still have a whole other day of awesome industry day. I want to make sure you know those resources are there. Day one's videos are already up on YouTube. Day two's getting put up on YouTube right now. So for those, if you have friends that couldn't make it, you can share it there. Um, and also there's a chat or there's a link to gather where industry day is tomorrow. A few of us are going to go back in there after this and just going to hang out talk to you, explore the scene. And yes, as Gerald's looking for the hoodie, there is one Defense Unicorn hoodie hidden somewhere. 
um, that people can find. There's other Easter eggs too. Um, but yeah, without that, uh, Rob, over to you. Or oh, he's typing, he's in the middle. He's trying to keep up with Gerald, Gerald's links probably. Yeah, I just uh, want to say thank you for everybody who who joined, all of the, the speakers and the guests. Thank you so much. This was this was uh, incredible. It was really an experiment to kind of just figure out if there was a demand for this. Um, a lot of the, the people um, who got to present spent a lot of time, I think, uh, educating the community. Um, and, and, you know, I think it resonates with everybody. Anything we can do to better educate uh, the government um, is benefits everybody because uh, government leadership, uh, people in government leadership positions, um, the decisions you make impact uh, the entire world. Um, and so the better educated you are, the, the more informed you are, uh, the better everybody's lives get. Um, and so um, I, I know uh, not only myself, but all of our speakers are, are very, very passionate about, um, you know, enabling um, government leadership and government support contractors um, in, in terms of uh, making sure that they're adopting best practices, making sure that they're aware of the best technologies, uh, making sure that they understand um, things that are working and not working for other people. Um, so very much appreciate everybody's time. Uh, let us know if you'd like us to do this again. Uh, you know, this this will wrap up our, our two days of uh, sort of sessions. And then tomorrow uh, we're going to kick it off with a, a waffle breakfast, waffle Wednesday on Thursday, tomorrow morning and gather. Um, and then we're going to have an industry day. Um, and so if you haven't checked out gather, um, it looks like Matt and other folks have been posting the link. Um, you know, now's a good time to test out your computers. Uh, if you're on a GFE device, there's a chance that you might have to jump on a different device. Um, just let us know um, how it's working or not working. Um, excited for tomorrow, excited to talk to everybody. I have the whole day sort of blocked out to just uh, interact with folks. Um, so if you'd like to say hi, give us recommendations, you know, Matt posted in um, the survey link. So if you can fill that out, great. Um, I also know that some people are having ac issues accessing it. Um, so we'll make sure to send an email with that as well. Um, and with that, Matt, did you have any anything else? Yeah, last thing is all the links we're going to be sending out um, tonight, both for the feedback and for the links for Gather, because I know some of you can't get to them right now. So besides that, great day, great time. And thank you for everyone attending and in the chat. You guys have been great. Uh, and, uh, what, you know, time, what time do we kick off tomorrow again? Tomorrow starts at 0900 or 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time in the U.S. because we have people watching from all over the world. So whatever time that is for you, convert it or do what I do and go to the Google machine and convert it. And then we'll kind of just bleed. It's in the same space, Waffle Party. Waffle Wednesday on Thursday is in the same space as Industry Day. And so that can just kind of kick off at the same time. We'll have all the vendors and sponsors and everyone there for the whole time. And then you all there as attendees, that's the beauty of it. It's not just for booths. There's you can just walk around and talk to each other. That's kind of how Gather works. So <laughs> Valerio, our, man, our guy in the Netherlands is saying, uh, yeah, 1600 GMT. Yeah, and, uh, time zone. Final numbers for the event we had. Uh, over slightly over 800 people register over the two days, over 450 people logged in. Um, you know, throughout the two days, we we consistently had over 200 people logged in throughout a lot of the different sessions. Of course, the tail ends, the afternoon sessions, uh, more people in the East Coast start going home and, and dropping out, but uh, truly, truly inspired and impressed with the numbers. Matt, blown away by your energy. Thank you so much. Also to Lindy, who did a bunch of the back you know, back behind the scenes work, as well as Bernice and Courtney. Um, certainly appreciate you. Um, I'm sure I, I speak for everyone to just say that your ability to maintain a, a such a high amount of energy is is truly inspiring and your dedication to the community is, is impressive. And, and thank you so much for your time. Most welcome, appreciate it.